I've been asked today uh, to, to talk and to provoke and challenge all of us here. And um, I know that's a bit of a hard ask because of the current climate globally we are in. And for those of us who are here in Britain today, we know without certainty about what's going to happen on 29th or whether it's going to take another five or four years or it's going to be hard or soft or none. Or, uh, we, are, we are all following this quite closely to see what happens. So I know it's a hard time, but I, I want to just start off rather than talking about the grim news, to start off by talking about positives, because there have been positives in our world the last 20, 30 years. And I think the first one we've got to talk about is the fact that there are less people, generally speaking, now who are, are living in extreme poverty than before. And that's thanks very much to China, to India, to Africa, and the kind of development and growth that has happened, and Asia. So there's a lot of things that have gone on right. We know for a fact that today the world is more productive, is wealthier than ever before, at a time which is not is unprecedented amounts of productivity. Apartheid ended in our lifetime 25 years ago, which is a, so something, again, many of us who are a little older never thought would happen in our time. We have got more people who are educated. There's better immunization. HIV AIDS is no longer the death sentence it was 20 years ago. So we have, we have made some progress. We, now, we know there are, there are certainly gains, not enough yet, in, around women's rights and treating women equally. We know the, of the progress has been made around the LGBTIQ movement in a way that was, again, unprecedented and unthought, unthinking five, even five years ago. But amidst all that, so there's a positive side of life that's been good. But the negatives, which, is where we, which are the challenges which we need to keep addressing, are some of the ones now we want to talk about. I think the most important one, one of the most important, at least in my view, is the question of inequality in and between countries. And Oxfam gives us figures annually about how many, how, how, how just a few men control so much wealth in this world. I will come into that as well. And, and, and all the attendant things that come from, from, from inequalities like corruption, conflict, frustrations. We have populism, fascism, uh, the growth of the far right, intolerance growing everywhere. And we've got, uh, and, we've got uh, and also the, the lack of civic space for people. So democratic space is reducing. So, why, so the question we have to ask is why are all these challenges now and what do we do about them? In a, in a book which is called How Democracies Die, the authors talk about, uh, say that inequality and fear of others is, is inequality and fear of others. In this, this book, How Democracies Die, we have learned that the, the gist is that significant in economic inequalities feed polarization, which tears away at the soft tissue that hold democracies together. I would recommend you all look at that book because this is why we, I think we're having all these stresses we have. And in the question of inequalities, we have to question the role of business. And I know many of us now are struggling to figure out what we do as government funds shrink, as normal sources of income shrink. Is business the new way to get funding and be able to do the work we're doing? But you've got to question the role of business because it's an e it seems to be an easy place to go, but we have to, and I want to use this, I want to use the case of Amazon.com in the US. I'm living right now in Long Island City in New York, and Amazon had set up Long Island City as its second um, headquarters. So when it came, it, it, was, it, it, it had this bizarre thing, which I think was bizarre, where it invited cities to, to bid to host Amazon.com. And the bidding meant that they were going to give them benefits. So Amazon was promised $3 billion by the state of New York and the city of New York to set up. But it led to a lot of conflict, a lot of questions, a lot of, of debates within Long Island City, which, as some of you know, is the constituency that's represented by Alejandra Ortez, uh, Ortega Cortez, AOC, the young, the young congresswoman. And in the questioning that they were saying, when, when, when they were questioned by the Long Island City Council, Amazon said that they were going to provide 25,000 jobs. 25,000 jobs is not something to, to scoff at. It's a big a number of jobs. And they said that they would they'd have uh, the average income per, for, for those jobs would be $150,000 a year. That's the average income. But then they said that they would, not, they would be paying minimum wage. In New York, it's $15 an hour. And said the bulk of the workers would be 
those who are earning $15 per hour. So then the question is asked, how do you make up to get $150,000 per year if you're paying people minimum wage? They don't say what it is, but clearly it was the gap that meant that some people would be earning four or five million dollars to be able to raise the issue, raise it there, to raise them the average two hundred fifty thousand dollars. They also said they would not allow unions and they would take a stand against unionization of the workers, meaning they're, they're at the mercy of the company. This is the trend that's happening. The governments are kowtowing to business and becoming part of the, of the debate with business. And I think for us, we have to ask ourselves whether this is a trend we want to continue supporting or we want to challenge. Today, privatization is, is, making, is everywhere. Prisons are run by private companies. Military adventures are run by private companies. Infrastructural development is done by private companies. Healthcare, education. I mean, as you're seeing, for those of us from Africa, we, even religion has been privatized for purposes of profit making with all the evangelicals that come around. And so we ask ourselves, why, why is this happening? What, what can we do as, as people who are concerned with development and human rights? And where did we go wrong? I think for me, one of the most fundamentals is that we, we, all of us here, have become the elite. We are the elite that is being challenged across the world. We are the elite that is making people uneasy. And we have to confront that. We have become the status quo. And rather than being the underdog, which you've always been fighting and moving for more and more progress, we now seek to keep things as they are. And we've got to challenge ourselves on that issue. We've become too comfortable. And we, again, we focus very much on log frames. We focus on, uh, on indicators. And we have forgotten that our work is with people. Our work has to be with people. We have lost our linkages to people. And we are losing on that. And as we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, why, what, how do we go back to our roots? Because that's the roots of every single nonprofit organization. It is about people. We've got to bring people back front and center of what we do. We, we, have, forgotten, we, have, for, we have forgotten about solidarity. And now we work in silos. We are so professionalized. We have got our silos. We work in this. And that's all we're interested in. How do we move out of that? What is solidarity? And how do we get out of that? So it's, we compete among ourselves because the funds are limited. So we learn to compete. We don't work together. It's no longer a common goal. It's about my institution, my organization. And how do, I be, how do we get the media? How do we get in the front line of this so we can be supported? It's about jobs. And we're doing all that stuff. We're, then, we're all suffering from the question about how we can go on. So we also need to look at the question of of international NGOs versus INGOs. And I, and I feel very, this is an issue that's disturbed me a lot, a lot in my life, having been both at a local NGO, both at the CBO level, and also at international NGO. And it's a question that keeps coming back in many ways. How do we deal with this? What value do we add as international NGOs? Are we doing things that should be done by the locals? Yesterday, Baroness Tani Gray Thompson told us that we have moved from situations where men spoke for women and need to do the same for, from able-bodied speaking for the disabled. And I think this is something we need to keep asking ourselves about that relationship between INGOs and NGOs. Are we doing things that could be done by those who are living it? And in fact, for us in human rights, we, have often we often speak that we are the voice of the voiceless. And the challenge now for us is to start giving voice is our task now is to turn it around and so that the voiceless have voice. We cannot start speaking. We cannot continue speaking for people. People can speak for themselves. And the challenge for us, even in development, is to let people do as much of that work themselves. That, to me, is the most important thing that we, that, that we, that we, that we ought to do. So what do we do? And where is the hope? And as we go into this, I think, in terms of solidarity, I want just to talk a little bit about a, a case study, which is true, and maybe some of you might know it, about Helvetas that, was working in, in, that works in Laos, where it's a development organization. Helvetas, for those who might know, many years ago, was organizing work around the Asian conference. And one of the people who was working closely with Helvetas, Sombath Swafon, was disappeared by the government of Laos. Nobody spoke except one person who was the director of, of Helvetas in Laos then. And after a few weeks, she was, she was uh, declared persona non grata. And still nobody spoke. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, what should development organizations do when human rights are violated in the place they're working? Should you keep quiet so you can stay there? Is staying in that country more important 
than the, than the safety and the lives of those you work with, your partners? That's quite this question I know, and I know many people, and I, we have again this debate among us in human rights. Do you go into, do you establish in a country that is going to use you as a fig leaf for itself, or do you decide you can work differently without being that fig leaf? People say that, well, when we're in the country, no matter how repressive, we can bear witness. But have you seen anybody ever bearing witness after they have left the country by being in the country? We never bear witness, but instead we give comfort to them. And I think there's questions we need to ask ourselves about whether we're doing the right thing. Or in terms of hope, I think we have a lot of hope. <laughs> and this coming from somebody who works in human rights and has been working in human rights all my life, I'm very hopeful. I'm hopeful because change is happening in front of our eyes. As governments become more repressive, as, as communities become more intolerant, people are still fighting and resisting. The social movements that are going around the world are unstoppable. They're unstoppable. We can't stop them. And they are, they are organizing in different ways. And I think that is the future. And we have to figure out how we fit in and work with, the, with these social movements or we're, going to be, or we're going to be made irrelevant. Change is inevitable. We have seen South Koreans gathering in, in, in a couple of years ago, South Koreans gathering every Saturday for 23 Saturdays, a million people to protest and demand the end, the, uh, the, the president to step down and be impeached and forcing her party to impeach her. And that one million, by the way, was not just, was not just ordinary people coming together. It was human rights organizations, it was labor, it was development organizations in South Korea organizing people to come out. They took a stand for the benefit of their country, and I think things are better on. I think for us, we have to have a lot more reflection and inflection, all of us. We need to have less, we need to be a, little, a lot more humble about what we do and ask ourselves. We need to figure out how to get to the root causes of, of issues rather than, than dealing with symptoms and we need to get out there. We need to, to go out and be out with the people over and over again. People are the source and the, and, and the, and the reason why we do this work. And, but I'm also hopeful, I think, one of the things I've learned over time doing this work is that people who work in NGOs, in charities, in nonprofits, don't do it for the money, I hope. And, and I don't think, because many of us have the skills to be in better jobs than we are in now or more better paying jobs, maybe not better jobs, better paying jobs. But we do it because we care. We have a passion, we have an interest in this work. We want to influence and see, make the world better. That is what we've got going for us, that's our strength. That's the passion we need to keep bringing and challenging the orthodoxy and rocking the boat because the boat needs to be rocked, whether it's an institution or it's a government. We've got asked for accountability from DFID and from the British government, even, if, even as they fund you. I know it sounds hard, but it can be done. Because if all of you here who are getting funding from DFID challenge DFID and hold it accountable, there's nobody else to fund but you. They'll have to keep giving you money. So you've got to challenge DFID. <laughs> DFID has to give the money out. And you have, we, we can't leave the job of challenging DFID to the Daily Mail. We can't. We can't. It's got to be us, and I think that's our challenge for all of us here, is to see how we can do this. I think, so I just want to say that as far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, we must not lose the passion. We have got the passion that brought us into this work, whether it is development, whether it is human rights, whether it's humanitarian work. That passion must not die. It must not be a job. We must harness that, we must move that, and we must always remember that as independent organizations, even if we sometimes are contractors of governments, even if we are, we must never lose the, the, the element of, of speaking truth to power and holding governments and businesses accountable. Thank you.